Okay, hello, good evening, and welcome to the second Q&A uh, of the spring term uh, as part of the Royal Holloway Geography for Schools lecture series. Uh, tonight, we are going to be meeting uh, Celia Martin Puertas, Dr. Celia Martin Puertas, uh, following on from her amazing lecture last week on global atmospheric and ocean circulation systems. So uh, let me just bring Celia in. Hello, Celia, good evening Hello. and welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting no, me. No, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for your lecture last week, which has had loads of engagement on, on YouTube and on our Facebook page. And tonight, I think, I hope that we're also experimenting by broadcasting live on our Twitter channel as well to try and bring this uh, Q&A to an even wider audience. Uh, just as a, a few reminders for people, if people would like to ask any questions, uh, please do so. You can ask questions in the chat under the Facebook feed uh, or under the, the YouTube video. And I'll be able to see your questions here and I can put them straight to Celia. So you can have your questions answered. So teachers, if you've been gathering questions from your classes over the last week, feel free to ask them now. And as I say, I can put them to Celia. Uh, and also to say that Celia has uh, been preparing some really helpful teaching resources that are available on our Teacher Hub. And the links are under this, this video as well on Facebook and YouTube. Celia, in fact, do you just want to say a very quick word about those teaching resources that you've been making? Because I know that an extra special effort has gone into it with one of your PhD students. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, so well, with the seminar last week, I wanted to give basic uh, basic knowledge on the Earth's climate system. So what the main elements of the climate system are, the role of the sun as the energy supplier and the acting of this uh, energy between the Earth's surface and the space. So I focus on the role of the atmosphere and the ocean as these two elements of the climate system are responsible for distributing the heat received from the sun around the planet, creating the different uh, climatic zones and biomes, like the, from the equator to the polar regions, from rainforest to, to, to deserts. So yeah, the ocean and the atmosphere are connected, but work on different tiny scales. So while the atmosphere transport heat and humidity relatively fast and explains uh, weather variability, the ocean is uh, slower because can store heat for much uh, longer and can drive climate changes on millennial tiny scale. So atmospheric and ocean circulations are very complex but have a common engine, uh, and this is the, uh, the temperature gradient. So the equator receives more solar energy than the polar regions, which make it uh, hotter. And this causes temperature gradients in both hemispheres that initiates atmospheric and ocean currents. So the in-class activity, as you said, in, is a story map. Uh, about the ocean circulations and the different water masses in depth and the ocean currents around the planet. So I hope the teachers and, and the students had uh, enjoy exploring the, the ocean. And yeah, so just to say that understanding the Earth climate system is very important for the study of the past, present and future climate change. And in particular, uh, now with the climate crisis that we are facing, um, understanding how the ocean and the atmosphere work and interact uh, is, uh, is re very important, for example, to better predict uh, extreme weather events like floods or heat wave and um, help to anticipate and be ready for uh, a changing weather and many other uh, natural disasters in the future, which are more and more often uh, due to global warming. Celia, thank, thanks so much. And, and I know that p uh, teachers have already started downloading and accessing the, the teaching resources that, as I say, are available on the Royal Holloway Geography Teacher Hub. And I know that's going to be massively helpful for, for lots of people. I mean, I don't think anyone can deny, I mean, that this is an incredibly important, but sometimes quite complex uh, subject to teach. So I, I think if, if we can make it more accessible, then, uh, then that's obviously really important. You've kind of, uh, in, in explaining that, that teaching resource and in, in, in introducing us, you, you've kind of slightly reviewed last week's lecture to some extent. Um, is there anything else that you just want to say now in order just to bring everybody up to speed in case they haven't seen your lecture last week? We've got a couple of graphics that we can also show here, um, if that would be helpful, uh, if you want to, to just talk through some of the key points that you were making in last week's lecture. 
Yeah. Okay. So you can you can show the the pictures of the etchings yeah. of. Uh, shall, I bring in, shall I bring in this picture first of all? Okay. So yeah. So in this picture, you can see how the maximum insulation. So insulation means that. Uh, incoming solar radiation so the energy come from the sun and because of the position of the earth and because the earth is tills uh, the equator receive uh, much more uh, solar energy than the polar regions so there is uh, this solar energy when uh, reach the earth's surface uh, becomes in temperature so heat and there is a surplus of heat in the equator and a deficit in the polar regions. So as the earth and the climate system as are all these uh, physics uh, mechanisms in nature, so they need to try to keep a balance. So and how, so brings uh, this heat from the equator to the polar regions. So the earth can be in a temperature uh, balance. And um, yeah, so this is basically how everything, so this is the engine for atmospheric and ocean uh, circulation, this tem temperature gradient between the equator and the polar regions. So, so that, that differential is absolutely critical, isn't it? And, and you, if I bring up the next graphic, because you've, you've used the analogy of a radiator heating a room in order to try and describe this, I think a little bit better for us as, as a model. Yeah, so this is basically how a convection cell set works, and it's how it works uh, the atmospheric uh, currents and the ocean currents as well. So, yeah, in this uh, in this image, you can see like an uh, analog of uh, how the Earth system. So the Earth would be, so the Earth surface would be this room. The equator would be the hot radiator, and the cold window um, would be the polar regions. So basically, uh, in this picture, we can see how uh, the hot uh, air close to the equator, to the hot radiator, go up to the top of the room. Could be our um, atmosphere. So the top of uh, the ceiling should be like uh, the tropopause is um, the first layer of the uh, of, uh, troposphere. I mean, the, the first layer of the atmosphere is called troposphere. So the air goes up to the top of the troposphere, um, travel uh, to the north, to the uh, cold regions. And once he gets uh, cooler, so this air is heavier and go down again to the surface, to the air surface, and travel again to the equator to, the equator to get warmer. So it's always... Uh, trying to get cooler and then try to get warmer again. And this is the, the cycle. And the same in the ocean. So, so the, the, those mechanisms happen in the air and they happen, they happen in the seas. And, and the, those are the things that are, are driving that movement of yes. heat from the, from the equatorial region to, to, the polar, to the polar regions. Okay, so I, I am not, as many people who have followed these uh, conversations know, I am not a physical geographer. So I am, but I, I've got this kind of latent memory of when I, of course, studied physical geography yeah. at school and university. So I'm finding these things fascinating <laughs> because it's, rem it's reminding me of some of the things that I learned at, at school and university uh, as well. Um, and so just, just as a further question, that, that um, kind of cellular kind of structure that you've just described that that's there's not one kind of massive global cell that's doing that i remember from, from your lecture last week you described there are about three cells in the north and in the southern hemisphere that are kind of bringing hot air and it again sometimes down to the surface and then back up into the high atmosphere and these also are uh, kind of explain the trade winds in the north and in yeah the exactly yeah so it's uh, i mean in a very simple uh, planet should be only one cell going through the equator to the polar regions, but because the Earth is uh, rotating, so there is a uh, different effect. So the the air going or traveling to the to the northern part uh, is like uh, receive a curve, so it's uh, around the planet. And then there is a, a limit at 30 degrees uh, north from the equator. 
that the, the, the earth is getting cooler and go down again. And the same happened in the polar region. So there is a, around 60 degrees north from the polar region, there, the air is traveling and goes up to the, to the upper part of this atmosphere to get cooler again. So this is why, and in the ocean is the same. So in a ideal ocean, only one ocean with no continents, uh, the, the currents could be from the equator to the polar regions, but because we have this uh, movement, I mean, the rotation of the earth and also the continent, so yeah. the, the, the ocean currents cannot go through the continent and they need to uh, go around. So uh, I'm trying to, again, pull out from my memory there's is it the Coriolis effect Coriolis effect exactly that, that's that's the the rotation yes. of the earth and the effect that that has on the atmosphere exactly yeah the Coriolis effect okay Celia thank you uh, as so as I've already admitted I'm not a physical geographer but I am a political geographer and one of the things I really like are disaster movies particularly because of the way that they often expose yeah. Uh, particular realities or, or possibilities about the geopolitical world. And one of the disaster movies that I really liked from a number of years ago was called The Day After Tomorrow. I don't know if you, oh, yes. <laughs> you, know, you remember that movie, Celia? I um, remember that one. One of the things that terrified me about your lecture was you were describing, I think it was called the, the thermohaline circulation. And it was, it was in the video you showed right at the end. And, and this was going to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so the, the, the ocean temperature increases, uh, there's increasing, increasing uh, ice pack and glacial melt in the north and in the south, um, which then leads to more fresh water in the oceans. And, and from what I could understand, that has the potential to, to kind of cut off some of the, the kind of the North Atlantic drift, as we would call it. And my memory went back to the day after tomorrow. Because yeah, that, exactly. that film was all about the North Atlantic drift being disrupted. And you and in your video, you showed snow and ice falling across Northern Europe. Tell me, is that going to happen? Yeah, I, could, I mean, I'm a really big fan of this movie as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I always tell to my students about this movie. They don't remember, of course. I know, um, it's so old. So many people like so me. Old, yeah. remember it. <laughs> but yeah, so this happens like 12,000 years ago when at the end of the last glaciation, so there was a warmer temperature, so the, the, the ice cap was uh, melting, and this melting generated like an episode of 200 years of very, very cold temperature. So going back again to the uh, glacial conditions. So this period is called Jungle Dryas, and after the Jungle Dryas, uh, the temperature go up again. So, yeah, it's like a kind of uh, gear effect of the climate system. So it should be like a very uh, abrupt climate changes and not very long. But, yeah, this can happen again uh, in, the, in the future. So it's like uh, the warming can create a cooling effect for a few um, hundred years or so, and right. then coming back to the warming again. And yeah, so this is basically because the gradient, the, the temperature gradient between the equator and the polar regions is uh, weaker. Okay. And then the ocean circulation is uh, slower. And so the this, effect so for that, that is, is uh, cooling again. So this has happened in the past. So this isn't just a the this isn't just theoretical. Um, no, it's not theoretical. So it's happening in the past uh, before. So yeah, several times. Now, one of the other things in that movie was that they had these marker boys uh, in, in the North Atlantic that were measuring, I think it was salinity and water temperature. Do we, is there a similar set of scientific instruments bobbing around in the North Atlantic that are doing similar kind of measurements? Yeah, they're everywhere around the ocean. So there are boys uh, everywhere, especially in the North Atlantic. It's a very key region because uh, in, the, in the story, we, we mark these uh, points where there is deep water formation. And this okay. deep water formation is really the, the engine for, for the uh, thermal in circulation. So all the water circulation around the whole world. So yeah, so we are measuring temperature, we are measuring temperature, uh, salinity, and this is very key for oceanographer. Okay, 
Um, listen, what I'm going to do is just to prove to people that I'm not making this up. I'm going to here. Here is the cover image. <laughs> Uh, Celine, you, Celia, you, you will recognize this the day after tomorrow. Uh, that's the prospect of the catastrophic finale of the film with uh, New York and much of Northern Europe covered, covered in ice. I mean, I don't, we're not at that stage yet. But no, I mean, and it's, I mean, something that is, cannot happen from the movie is like, it's not going to happen in two days or in one week. So it yeah. takes uh, longer like a couple of, uh, I don't know, 50 years or so. And that's so why directors not... should never be directors of disaster movies because we, we didn't... No, just... no, <laughs> and the change is not like global. So it's more regional than, than global. Yeah. So yeah, what we know from the past is like, it's, uh, so the last, uh, this event in the past 12,000 years ago happening in the North Atlantic, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere only, and uh, it was not like in one week, it took a, a couple of decades. Okay. And no, no. all the regions uh, in the same way. We ha I have time to buy extra thick thermal pajamas. In of, of <laughs> you have time, yeah. Celia, we have a few questions that have come in. Uh, can okay. I, I'm going to put them to you, if, if I may. Um, yeah. this, this is really exciting. Uh, let, me, let me bring it up on screen. Okay, so uh, this has been relayed to us. We have a question from Bilborough College Geography Department. Well, first of all, hello to Bilborough College Geography Department. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, how is climate change impacting on the different circulation systems that, that you have been referring to today? You have, you've mentioned that briefly, I think, but maybe just to reiterate, how is climate change affecting some of these circulation patterns? Yeah, so there is not like a clear answer for that, and uh, we don't know exactly. So what we know is when the when the climate is uh, or, or it's hotter, so that the temperature is hotter, all these uh, uh, um, how do you say like uh, the boundaries between the Haley cells, the ferrous cells, and the porous cells, everything goes to the south not to the north, sorry. So is displacing us these uh, um, climate zones a little bit to the north. And this is especially important for the regions that they are uh, at the edge of these uh, zones, so at the edge between the Haley cells and the, and the um, uh, Haley and, and the Ferber cell, for example, or this Mediterranean area is very vulnerable to um water sources for example um and the same with the north i mean the the, the connection between the halis the sorry the fur cells and the polar cells so around 60 degrees north of uh, of latitude where the climate zone can change from the forest to the desert for example and this is right. happening in the mediterranean now that they have so many droughts yeah. and uh, this is actually where your work and, my, and some of my work meet because um, I've been working in the former no man's land of the First World War uh, along the, the trenches of the First World War. And one of the things that is happening there is that a lot of the forests that were planted there after the First World War um, are now struggling to survive in a climate that is, is rapidly uh, yeah. raising temperature. So what, what the French government are now doing is they're planting trees that used to be grown in the south of France up in, in effectively the same latitude as Paris because yeah. they're far more climatically appropriate uh, to Paris now. Um, uh, you know, so in, in the case of like 50 or 60 years, um, the, the French government are effectively saying that the, the climate that used to exist in the south of France 50 or 60 years ago is now becoming the climate that can be that can be regularly experienced up in Paris. Yeah, exactly. All these climatic zones can vary like uh, five, ten degrees north, all of them. Yeah. So, yeah, we can expect here, for example, to have the same climate as the north of Spain or... <laughs> Well, I'm sure that some you know, wine growers and potential champagne growers in southern England are getting very excited about that prospect, because as those climatic zones uh, uh, travel further north, presumably we will have to adjust our lives and and our and our industries and our agriculture to accommodate that. Yeah. 
So another uh, effect of the climate change, it ocean and atmospheric circulation is uh, that we have more uh, extreme weather events and they are completely unpredictable. So models, uh, weather forecasts, they are not able to predict these uh, weather events, the frequency and the magnitude of them. And they're uh, coming <laughs> very, very often right now. So it's like the climate system is becoming more unpredictable. Absolutely. And, it's, and, and it, it would be wrong, of course, to uh, to kind of try and suggest that climate change is, is merely an agricultural opportunity, because, of course, that the changing climate can also lead to very severe uh, stresses in, for yeah. example, you know, in southern Spain and, and elsewhere, where water is becoming increasingly scarce, as we know. Exactly. And very unpredictable. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have another question as well, and it's actually on something that we were going to, I was going to ask you about. So I'm bringing this up. So we've got Simon Holland, who's asking, what are the links between the ENSO? So that's the El Nino, I think, El Nino Southern Oscillation? Yes. And, uh, and circulation teleconnections. Uh, students find this really hard. Thanks so much for a great lecture and excellent teaching resources. Well, Simon, you're very welcome uh, on that latter point. Um, and I was going to uh, ask Celia as well about El Nino and La Nina because la, this year is a, is a La Nina year. But mm -hmm. Celia, do you just want to try and explain uh, what El Nino and La Nina are and how they relate to what you've been speaking about this evening? Yeah, so this is a very complex uh, <laughs> uh, mechanism. And it's very important because is a very clear example about how the ocean and the atmosphere interact. And because this is happening on the um, equator and the subtropical areas, so it's uh, influencing in uh, the monsoon as well, and also in um, atmospheric circulation in, in, in the northern region or the southern region so at the right. mid-latitude. So I sent you on a yeah, slide. I've got, I've got this graphic. Uh, let me just yeah, take so I think it's, it's because it's very complex. I think uh, I will try my best I'll, to I'll explain. Hide, that. I'll hide Simon's question for just now as well, just so that we can concentrate on the graphic. Okay. So in my talk, I uh, I said that at the equator, uh, not the equator, but in the subtropical area. So the main or, or the prevailing winds are trade winds. So uh, winds coming from the east to the west, okay? And if you can see in this normal state of, state of trade winds, you can see how this uh, conventional um, uh, belt is, uh, or, or this um, uh, convection cells is working. So trade yeah. winds from uh, the uh, American, or the Pacific, uh, um, American Pacific coast goes to Australia and the Asian coast yeah. and go up again. Okay. So what's happened during La Nina is when these uh, trade winds are very strong, are very strong. So they uh, take water from the uh, American coast uh, to the, to the uh, Australia and this uh, South Pacific area. And um, so they bring hot uh, water from the uh, American coast to uh, Australia. And this, this displacement of water uh, make a kind of a hole or a low pressure center in the, in the, in the water surface that is replaced with, um, with, uh, uh, deeper water, so cold water. Then, the cold so water it's the, 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 up the, from the bottom of the, the ocean. American coast. Yeah, there is like kind of upwelling there because, yeah. yeah. So think like you have all the surface water are very hot. Go to the to the west part. Got it. And this uh, this water is replaced by colder water from the deeper. And that's part what we're seeing, Celia, in that little cross section. Underneath yes, your, your, exactly. your ocean, we can see that cold water surging up to the surface on the on the West American coast. Yeah, exactly. So what what is happened during La Nina is in 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 the in the American coast is uh, cooler, 
so that they're cooler weather and very dry and it's getting all the humidity and hot uh, temperature to the Atlantis and the Asian uh, coast with more precipitation, okay? Right, and so in, a, so in a La Nina year, you get- uh, Strong you get winds. Strong, strong winds, cooler, cooler ocean temperatures in, in, on the American Western coast and, yes. and dry. Yes. And all of that humidity is being pumped to the, uh, pumped to the West, to the, to the uh, Asian and Australasian region. Exactly. And this upwelling, for example, is very important because it's bringing nutrients to, to this part. So there are more productivity in the ocean, more algae and, and then more fishes as well. So it's very good for uh, fishing during La Nina in the, in the American Western coast. Okay. So if you, if you are, if you're in Mexico yeah. Uh, or yeah or, or along I guess along the Chilean coast then you can have a yeah. very productive year as a fisherman very productive years yes and then what's happened with El Nino is the opposite so in the Nino is uh, uh, weak winds so the winds uh, the winds are weaker and they don't have strong energy to transport the water from the east to the west so what's happened there is in the middle of the Pacific, uh, the, these uh, convection cells is divided into two. Okay. Because, yeah, there is not uh, strong energy to displace of the water. So the warmer water is uh, concentrated in the, in the east uh, part of the Pacific, the cold water in the west part of the Pacific, and then there is uh, two convection cells and um, the low pressure center bringing the precipitations are in the middle of the Pacific and also bringing temperature to the, to the uh, temperature, no, sorry, precipitation to the American Western coast. Okay, so in, in, a, in an El Nino year, that heat gets focused on that western coast in of the, the western exactly exactly of, of the americas so it almost intensifies because you don't have that oceanic movement uh, taking things all the way across the pacific so that warm exactly. water gets focused on the uh, on that it's west like, coast yeah the, the winds have no power enough to bring all the um, hot water from the from the pacific, from the from the western part to the east part so what kind of weather conditions could one expect to find, you know, on the West Coast? So it's, of very, it's very dry in, in Asia and Australia, and it's, uh, it's a lot of floods and precipitation in, in, uh, in, in Chile, Mexico, in all this uh, California, so this part of uh, the West Coast of America. And that this is, is happening every seven years. So, so there's, a fairly, uh, there's a fairly a fair regularity to that. It's a very regular set, yes. Right. So, and, and can you predict in advance if it's going to be an El Nino or La Nina year? It's it every seven years. Is uh, two years, two three years of uh, El Nino. There is a neutral situation, and then La Nina, and this cycle is between seven nine years, right. and this is the cyclicity. I had I had no idea. And this I, is this combination no between ocean circulation and also atmospheric circulation. That is that is amazing, Simon. Uh, Simon Holland. I hope that has answered your question. Um, I've certainly learned. Yeah, a lot but from... I mean, it's very complex. It's very complex, and also uh, there is a connection between El Nino and the monsoon uh, system as well. Right. So the the monsoon that would that would then what drive rainfall up through in yeah. the Indian continent, for example. Yeah, uh, that's possibly going to stretch us too far today, but we, we note that connection and we may explore that with you at some future point, Celia. Uh, that, is, that is amazing. Um, I have another question for you as well uh, from, from Abjit Gupta, uh, who asks, um, how is the absor uh, absorption of CO2 in the ocean or how how the absorption of CO2 in the ocean affect the precipitation systems of the globe. So it is, I think he's exploring that connection between CO2 absorption and precipitation. Is that easy, easy to deal with? 
I don't know, <laughs> to be honest, sorry. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the ocean is a, a, is a store of, uh, of CO2. So, actually, if, uh, if the ocean absorbs CO2, the CO2 is not in the atmosphere, so it's not acting as, a, as a greenhouse gases. Yeah. So, it's good for global warming if uh, all this CO2 is uh, keeping in the ocean. But what is happening is that uh, because the, wet, the, the water is uh, warmer, so all these gases are more soluble in the water. So they go to the, to the atmosphere again and it's contributing to the uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So how this affects precipitation system? So I think it's, again, through, the, through, the, through this uh, Haley and so all this uh, low pressure center creating in, in a specific part uh, around the planet. But I don't, I don't have like a very direct questions for, for that. So I can speculate that from the physics that I know. That, that's really helpful, but you've been able to apply your thinking to, to considering that the potential connection there um, and I don't think, you know, we necessarily have all of the answers. I mean, some, you know, I think yeah. we also have to defer to experts in their, in their fields uh, elsewhere. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one to, to follow up on. Um, so thank you very much for that brilliant question, uh, Abjit. And, and Celia, one of the, I just w want to kind of ask you, because you mentioned it in passing, but the, the increasing uh, temperatures in our atmosphere, this is in relation to, to climate change and the way that our oceanic and air circulations are, are changing. You, you mentioned the fact that as there is more energy in the atmosphere, the more likely we are to have extreme weather events. And I mean, of course, we, we see or, or we, we think we see more extreme weather events happening around us all the time, you know, whether that be High, high winds or, or summer storms in this country. But one of the things that you also really encouraged us uh, to think about in your lecture is to think about the longer term and, and not to necessarily see, um, you know, a particularly hot summer as absolute evidence of climate change, but, but to think of across a, a, a far longer time horizon. Do you, do you want to just tell us, I mean, it, it's one of the risks of being a climate scientist, isn't it? Because, you know, you're driven by science. You're, you you acknowledge the fact that it's important to think about averages, but but people are also wanting evidence of of climate change. So I, I just wonder, as a climate scientist yourself, um, do you find yourself coming under pressure to try and uh, you know say, yeah, this is this is this is climate change, or do you do you kind of fall back on the position that what we look for is kind of general evidence of climate change over time? It's a slightly roundabout question, but I think it, it gets to the difficulties of communicating climate change. Yeah. As so as I said in my lecture, so weather is, uh, can be very, very able from uh, hours to months to years. And when we talk about climate change, we talk about long-term averages. So we take 50, 30, 50 years in average. So to see, you, you need to, to see like a trend of increasing in temperature. So not because one summer is very hot. This is means that this climate change is happening. So climate change is happening. This is for sure, because we are seeing this uh, long-term uh, trend uh, since the industrial revolution. And it's also, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's gradual and gradual as, um, as the uh, greenhouse gases are increasing in the atmosphere, right? But what is true as well is that with this uh, changing climate and this, we, we are crossing a threshold of the Earth climate system as we know the Earth climate system today. So this is why we, uh, the scientists, we identify this uh, 1.5 uh, degree as a threshold because if we cross the threshold, the climate system can completely change. And this is what we call tipping point. So the climate system can completely react in another way that we don't know, we cannot predict. And we can see that, that there is like when one summer is very hot 
and all this extreme weather event is happening more and more often is like the weather variability is crossing these thresholds and then go back and go back but once we cross this threshold uh, all the time so this uh, this climate change will happen and the climate system will change completely but yeah i think i mean the the, the frequency and the magnitude of these extreme weather events is what we are alerting of uh, these change can happen soon. Celia, thanks. Uh, that's actually been really helpful. Um, I, I have to say I wasn't entirely sure of the origins of the one and a half degrees that, of course, gets so widely talked about. But I think what you've said there then is that up to one and a half degree increase, um, there, are, there are certain kinds of um, predictabilities uh, about what might happen in the world up to one and a half degrees. Beyond that, it becomes far more difficult for scientists to predict what, what may happen. Um, and, and also, there's a, I think there's an expectation then that one and a half degrees could be a tipping point over, over which fundamental Earth systems begin to change. Exactly. See, uh, all the mechanisms that the climate system are connecting with the creosphere, with the um, forest. So all these connections can change in a way that we don't know. I think that's a really powerful way to, to end this, this session, taking us back to that one and a half degree and to, to the importance of it. Uh, Celia, I'd like to thank you personally, because I have learned a huge amount uh, through both <laughs> the and, and this Q&A. And judging by the questions that have been asked and expertly answered by you, I think other people at home will have learned a lot and have, have really appreciated the, these two sessions uh, as well. Um, Celia, just sit there for a moment, if you will, because I just want to bring up um, a couple of extra bits of information as we look forward uh, in, in these sessions. Uh, we have coming up on the 7th of February, we've got um, Sustainable Cities Are Accessible, Green, Blue and Fair. That is Professor David Simon, who will be talking about uh, key features of sustainable urban areas and the prospects and challenges of achieving them. Uh, the week after that 7th of February lecture, there will be again another uh, online Q&A. And then on the 28th of February, we have Dr. Adrian Palmer talking about the patterns of glacial retreat, exploring how and when glaciers retreated in the recent past to predict future glacial changes. So that's another two fantastic sessions that we have uh, leading up to, to Easter. And to remind everybody as well, each one of these lectures is supported with a range of teaching materials that, uh, that you can use in the classroom if you're a teacher or if you're a student, you might just want to expand uh, on your work and, or, or use these for revision purposes. So you can use these in lots of different kinds uh, of ways. Uh, Celia, let me come back to you uh, just one final time to say a huge thank you to you for an amazing uh, couple of sessions together. Um, and yeah, we'll, we will see uh, everybody thank else. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. You're, you're very welcome. <laughs> and we'll see everybody else next week for, for more of the same. Celia, thanks again. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.